Okay, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Um, thanks for the introduction and um, the nice words. Um, maybe I'm responsible for the funny translations as well, so maybe it's not that great of a resource that I thought it would be. Um, also, you said that I have done a lot of different things. I think I'm always doing the same thing, uh, but you will see if there's something new that you haven't heard before. <coughs> I think most things that, that I do are related to multilingual data sets and what you can do with these data sets. So machine translation is one direction, uh, but I also heard that there will be another pr uh, presentation on machine translation, so I'm not going to talk about this. But instead, I will try to uh, figure, uh, figure out some, some other ways of using multilingual data for learning information, interesting information. Um, I think I slightly changed my title, but it's more or less the same. As, as you have seen in a program. Um, so what I want to talk about is learning from multilingual data and in the sense that you can use um, translations as some supervision, linguistic supervision. And we will see what I mean by that uh, in a few minutes. So just introduction. I think this is a picture that I really like uh, for introducing also to students what computational linguistics is all about. And uh, maybe this is a bit too much of a background information here, but let's say we want to use human languages and we want to do some computational models. So that's our goal in computational linguistics. And uh, I think you can divide it uh, quite easily into two different tasks. The understanding part, you have seen the speech recognition, for example, understanding at least to recognize some text, but real understanding to get the meaning behind this, I think is one of the big goals of, of computational linguistics. Um, and the other goal would be then the opposite speaking. So you also want to, of course, use these models and, and try to see if, if computers or uh, technology can, can do the same as humans speaking language, natural languages. So um, most people probably have seen a similar picture like this before. So, so questions, of course, what, what do we do? How do we represent this meaning? So if you want to do understanding, then we want to do this in a formal way because this is uh, supposed to be a computational model. So we want to have some meaning representation, and the big question is then, how can we do this? How can we formalize things that uh, a computer can analyze from human languages? Um, if you see this picture, then also, of course, if you put two different languages on these both sides, then, then this picture becomes quite familiar to m many of you, uh, especially those working on machine translation, because this now becomes exactly the situation where machine translation comes into the picture. You understand one language, you produce another language, and this is this famous uh, uh, picture illustration that, that illustrates somehow machine translation and the relation to computational linguistics. I think it's a nice picture and motivates me, for example, that uh, machine translation is something that people should look at because it nicely integrates everything that we care about in, in language technology. Um, so, why taking this up? <coughs> so, I want to talk about multilingual data. That was one motivation here, of course. Um, but now coming more to the point that I don't want to go into machine translation, but using multilingual data for other things. And here I want to introduce just <coughs> quickly again, a bit more background. Um, as you probably all know, we can, we can use uh, annotated data for learning, for example, models. So these typical supervised approaches that have some linguistic theory behind it. Um, and then you either do some handcrafting of a grammar, for example, uh, so fully supervised by an expert, really uh, writing down some rules and putting some, some, some kind of system in place. Um, you can have also some learning approaches where you say that you have an expert or some, some trained experts to do uh, annotation in, in text data or in some, some kind of uh, language data. And this explicit annotation that you then uh, have uh, for, for looking at them, you can then use this for, for learning uh, models from these annotated data sets. So that's a typical supervised approach. Um, then, of course, we have the unsupervised approaches where we then do not have these explicit um, raw texts, and that's one more interesting, especially because there's more and more data available. And the approach here is, of course, that you then try to find these structures. Basically, what a linguist would do otherwise, um, going, for example, to some, some other countries and trying to document the language, you try to find patterns, and, and an expert is doing that. You can also teach a, a system trying to learn linguistic patterns or structures. And this is the typical unsupervised approach, finding something that makes, uh, makes a structure in, in the data sets that you see. So it's a completely data-driven approach. You try to find these abstractions, and then you have to do some modeling principles to 
drive that learning process. So basically you have to define how to learn from the data sets. And then of course you have many, many mixtures of, of these two methods. So that's a <coughs> very basic uh, background. Now looking at what linguistic annotation looks like, of course you all know that, but just to uh, give you this standard example of part of speech tagging. So let's say we have uh, these, these very coarse grained part of speech tags. They are, so this is annotation, this is typically aligned to some text. So you have a text that is aligned uh, to the annotation or the, the uh, annotation is aligned to the text. Um, and if you would say that this annotation is somehow is some kind of structured unit of an annotation language, again it's a language um, that is aligned to some degree in some way to the um, original language that you try to annotate. And the reason for this is of course that in this way you make information which is not explicit in the text make it explicit. You mark things that you don't have in a text before. And then you can of course learn from that or analyze what kind of uh, things you have in, in these running texts. So there's nothing wrong with this, but uh, something that is uh, of course a difficult uh, or a problem here is that this annotation is expensive. So you have to have someone who can make the annotation properly. So this re really requires expert knowledge. You need to train uh, people doing that. Uh, there will be also problems of disagreements. So we have to handle those kind of things. There must be some, some kind of formalism that you have predefined and maybe this will change. This means that annotation can also change. You have to have guidelines and trained experts. <coughs> so this becomes uh, a challenge and, and for many, many languages in the world you don't have annotation available. Now looking with my uh, uh, glasses uh, of, of my previous work, this looks like a parallel corpus. And uh, so basically this becomes my motivation here. So if, if that annotation is somehow aligned to a text um, and, and it looks like a parallel corpus, so maybe a parallel corpus could some kind of text. So you can treat translations as the human provided annotation of a source language. Um, and let's see what we can do with that kind of information. Um, also some people who worked on statistical MT before, maybe you recognize these example sentences, um, but I don't say much more about this. But let's just assume that uh, this is not so much different. Uh, annotation can be uh, any kind of language, usually a formal language, and then you have some, some explicit um, structure behind what you want to annotate. But in this way, uh, if you use human language, this is more not with the purpose of making something explicit, uh, to add this information, but just um, um, the information that could make things more explicit, but it's just provided as it is naturally from, from humans. So this all is motivation. Um, why this becomes interesting is because languages are so much different from each other. So, so things can be more explicit in one language than they are not, uh, than, they're explicit, uh, that they're, than they are in other languages. So there can be things that uh, become obvious in other languages where they, whereas they are hidden in, in, in um, a source language, for example. So a typical example is that you have ambiguous words, lexical ambiguity, um, so translations of jam, if you want to find that out, you can basically look at uh, different translations. So now I've here, I have different languages here um, becoming from, from certain publications that we have worked out or example sentences that I have extracted. So here this is English and Swedish. You can say that, okay, jam, maybe the typical case is that you have some, some kind of jam that you put on bread or so some, uh, so this is actually a compound word here, but it gives you the, the, the meaning of, of jam in that sense. But of course, if you look for jam in other contexts, you can find out quite a lot of different usages of, of the same token. Um, and that is something that um, also for lexicographers is difficult to find all these different senses of a word, uh, different word forms, also uh, different parts of speech that could have the same token. So you have uh, the verb jam to jam so that this uh, gets jammed into a, um, a printer, for example. Um, you, you can get into a jam, that's also a nice multi-word expression. Uh, and by looking at the translations, you can see that this is not translated in the same way and this makes things explicit, makes these differences obvious um, in the translation. So here again, this, this is the motivation of course, then using this, this information from translation to make things more explicit that you haven't seen 
which are hidden in the structures um, in the uh, original language. Does it make sense? Okay. So, so not so much new. I think this is this is something that people have used a lot. So, and, uh, of course, the interesting idea is here that you have these lexical overlaps are much different in different languages. So this is a picture from the Shuravsky and Martin textbook, and you can see there's different overlaps of of concepts. Um, and this is exactly the interesting part, that you have different overlaps giving you all the information. And now considering you would do that over many languages, maybe you can really make a lot of distinctions uh, for, for lexical items. Okay, so there's, there's other work. So this is a work by many other people. Uh, Helge Duvik, for example, he was working on semantic mirrors in Norway, in Bergen. And, and um, the idea is exactly the same, that you can use aligned parallel corpora uh, for finding out word senses, for example. And I don't know how many of you do something like this, uh, also personally looking at parallel corpora and translations to actually find out how things are used. Lingui is one of these websites, there's many more of those, where you can check um, usage of words in translation. And this can give you information about what different senses can you have. I think here I was looking for plain, um, it could be a, an airplane or referring to that, but can be also other kinds of planes. So you can see that there, um, well, this is the sense of, of airplane, and you can find out different usages by looking at the translation. So you can discover word senses, uh, but you can also discover semantic relations between words that actually translate back um, from, from plane, um, so that you can get the relations between different words by looking out at the translations that these words have. I come back to this, uh, how this can, uh, this can work. So you can find semantic fields by looking at translation and going back and forth and going also over via, uh, via different uh, languages. Okay, so here I think is, is a picture that summarizes maybe my main interest. So as I said, I'm, I'm very much focused on parallel corpora and multilingual data sets. So I have been working with this all the time, so not very much variation there. Um, but you can see that I think a parallel corpus is really one essential resource where you can do a lot of different things. Um, many things are related to translation, as you can see here, but it can be linguistics, cross-linguistic studies. Um, translation can also be more in the direction of um, a computer-aided translation or automatic translation, but you can also use it for com uh, language learning. I, I used it for annotation projection, for example, quite a lot. People are interested in translation studies, for example, to see what happens in translation. And I think I would like to look at, uh, especially, usages for lexicography, which I have hinted at already, and then also something that is more recent, which is uh, interesting in connection with deep learning and neural nets, so some kind of representation learning that can use information that comes from translation. Yeah. So one thing in red here is that alignment is, is one of these crucial things, and that's what I would also like to point out again. So a parallel corpus without alignment is not really a parallel corpus. You have to have some alignment, at least at sentence level, but then you also need some, 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 um, um, Subsentential alignments to do something more interesting between these uh, other units. So alignment is really one of these crucial things that, that also, of course, um, um, has has been a lot in in my work. Um, so relation to alignment is is Im important uh, when you work with parallel corpora. <coughs> By the way, if you have any questions, I prefer that that you just ask them right away. So, so if there's anything that you want to comment or maybe correct, please do so. Feel free to do that. Okay, so alignment. I think I, I do a lot of background here. I didn't really know what to expect who's coming to this conference. So if this is getting too boring, uh, let me know as well. So, so there's alignment, which, which I think I want to point out here is can be done without any supervision. And that's the nice thing. So I want to point out that you can do many things without explicit annotation. So instead of, of, of uh, someone training while well, first first marking marking up a lot of alignment, um, you can actually train alignment without any supervision, just just giving it the, the text, the parallel text. 
So this is also a picture from, from the same kind of introductory text uh, from Kevin Knight introducing statistical MT and you can see that this can, well, by distributional patterns you can find out what things to align and that's really, this is kind of a nice intuitive way of, of looking at this but this really comes down to these generative models that IBM had defined in the 1980s um, which was the starting point for statistical MT. So nowadays this is kind of interesting to point out again because many people are so young that they haven't really considered reading those papers, but, but here maybe it's not the case yet. But so um, generative, generative models, they try to define how one language is generated from another and you can use that in connection with expectation maximization to find out which words are aligned to each other. And this is the basic uh, information that will be needed by, by word-based and phrase-based and syntax-based statistical MT models. And there's these famous IBM models that have different kinds of properties and, and um, parameters and they can be trained uh, just by giving the text. So the byproduct by this, this training procedure that was meant for statistical MT, you actually get the alignment, which is then basically used for many other purposes. So this is nice thing for, for other kinds of work. So of course we want to be modern, uh, so there's neural machine translation as well now, which we'll hear about more later. And you have seen also uh, neural MT in, um, in action already. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a big hype of course around these uh, neural network models. And it's, it's similar that you have some kind of sequence to sequence mapping, but now it's a different procedure. You have some, some kind of uh, vector space uh, representations in the middle. and. Uh, if you have followed the uh, development, you will hear more about this later, as I said. You also have seen that things that have been added to these sequence-to-sequence -sequence models is these attention mechanisms um, that make use, that actually give the model the way to, to look at different positions in the source sentence when translating to the target language. Um, as this is also learned automatically from data, so the attention model is not given, but it's learned from data, this is again yet another way of, of getting some alignment which you get in an un unsupervised way. So you, you basically the system learns um, automatically where to look at what information is important for giving the, um, the translation or producing translations. So this, this then looks more or less uh, similar to, to what uh, the statistical MT models do. Uh, you get, again, as a byproduct, you get actually word alignments or token alignments in, in parallel sentences. So there's some kind of soft alignment that you can visualize, like in this matrix there, uh, where you see these uh, um, hot spots uh, which are aligned more heavily than others. Um, and then you can also visualize this with these lines below. So that's some pictures coming from um, other papers and introductions to neural MT. Have you all seen this before? Okay, well, as I said, this I'm not going to talk about MT, but I think this is great to have alignment in place. And this comes to some commercial break here. Uh, so this is the collection that, uh, that we have uh, heard about before already. So this is Opus, there's this big collection of parallel corpora that I have tried to compile over the years. Um, and uh, this is freely available, so, so you can get the parallel data resources from there because otherwise you cannot do anything, you need the data. So the data here is actually available. If you ever want to do something with parallel corpora, I think this is a very good starting point. Um, you will get them prepared in sentence-aligned format and you can also get some, some word alignments if you want to. So this is something that you can play around and I, I also play around with this, of course. So if you... If you want to look at that website, um, it might change in the future because it's still a server that is located um, in Uppsala, somewhere in the basement. Uh, the probably the URL will change at some point, uh, but we will forward the old URL. So, so we have parallel corpora, we know how to align them. So what can we actually do? So just to sum up, um, from the first part here, so I would, would like to know what we can learn from translations. We can use that at, as some kind of implicit linguistic supervision. Um, and I would like to just quickly go through these lexical semantics examples. Uh, as I mentioned before, word sense uh, discovery or discovery of, of semantic relations, uh, lexical fields that you can get from just purely looking at the data. 
Um, this is related to extracting synonyms that we have looked at, and I also have some work on identifying idiomatic expressions, also just by looking at the translations. So, first, very quickly on this word sense discovery. This is mainly work, uh, I refer to the work by Helge Duvig in Bergen. So he was looking at these uh, translation mirrors, um, which you can use for, for creating sense uh, repositories. So he had these examples of, of Norwegian English, and this is one of the basic examples that he typically gives. So if there's this word tak, tak um, in, in Norwegian, it has different senses, and you can see how this is translated uh, into English, into different words, and, and those words can be then also linked back to what they translate in, in the Norwegian text. So you can also see the variation of these words to other uh, Norwegian words to see how, the, how this is spreading. So this is the interesting part, um, and if you have this picture, you can see already that you have some overlaps here, overlapping parts, and you can use that information either statistically or just by, by looking at the um, um, set, set overlaps. You can see that there are certain senses that somehow come out of the data. So let's see that this one sense here that goes into roof and ceiling um, of, of TAG, um, but you also have, for example, what is that, uh, like, a, like a cover, you cover things by a tag, and you have also the verb sense where you, you, you take hold of something. So this becomes rather obvious by looking at the translations, and this is the method that he used for, for creating some, some word net like um, syn sets from, from aligned, word aligned data sets. So this is one thing, Another thing that is also very common for um, finding out semantic relations is to look at the context. And there's this famous um, quote um, that uh, uh, defines the hypothesis of distributional similarity. Uh, you can look at, at the use or the, the, the meaning of a word by looking at its company. So, so you, get, you know about the words by looking how it uh, co-occurs with other words um, in context. Um, so you shall know a word by a company it keeps. Um, and this can be done, of course, on a, on a monolingual setting, so you can see what kind of context is around a word in, in a monolingual text. Uh, and with this, you can find out relations between words. For example, um, dogs and cats probably appear in, in similar context. You can find out that there's some relation, semantic relation between them. Um, and things to drink are in the same kind of context. But now putting this into uh, a multilingual setting, so what we tried out is now not defining context as the monolingual context, but actually the translational context. So what things are translated, uh, these words are translated to, you can go through um, translations of different words into different languages and find out if there's a relation between them or not. Um, if you see here, this is now for, for Dutch, because that was uh, when I was in the Netherlands, we worked on that, uh, synonym extraction for, for Dutch words. So if you see that, uh, if, you, if you count just the statistics of, of uh, what, what kind of translations do we have for certain words, we can see that as some multidimensional context vector in this uh, uh, multilingual space. And if we now do some, some simple calculations, doing, doing vector space similarities, um, we, we can find out that certain vectors are closer to each other than others, and we can make assumptions that these are probably synonyms of each other. A simple idea that uh, because they have similar translations into other languages, we probably can infer that they have relations to each other. So with this, for example, this, this il illustration would just uh, point out that Lent and Foria uh, are somehow synonyms. They are synonyms um, in, in Dutch because they translate to similar words in the other languages. How I'm doing with time, actually, so <coughs> plenty of time, good. So, these are two very short examples. Let's go a bit more in detail in the, into the finding idiomatic expressions, because that's also an interesting example, I think, that um, came out of uh, another collaboration in the Netherlands. So we wanted to find out uh, very fixed expressions in, in Dutch uh, by looking at translations and also statistics in monolingual languages, uh, uh, text. So here, we have simple assumptions and saying that uh, one assumption is, for example, that idiomatic expressions, um, because they are fixed structures, 
um, but they maybe don't transfer easily to other languages. They have very unpredictable translations. That's one assumption that we did. Um, so, so that you, you cannot really um, know, or you, you don't have these, these very um, consistent translations. Um, and we can see that also if you, for example, we, we looked at uh, support verb constructions, like this, tot stand bringen, um, and, and looked at what kind of translations do you get. There's a lot of different uh, variations of, of translations that you can get. It's not very predictable um, because it has some, some uh, complex meaning as a composition together in this multi-word expression. And there's, in general, we observed that there's a, a larger variation in, in the translations. But yet another thing which was interesting is that also you can actually make use of the fact that word alignment doesn't work well for, for these kind of expressions because word alignment you have to consider that you have to align individual words to other words in the other language. But if you have an idiomatic expression that doesn't really uh, make, uh, make sense in, a, um, um, well in, in these units that they are comp composed of, um, so then it becomes very unpredictable what kind of things to align to because it might be yet another structure or maybe just a single word that has to be aligned. So, so in, in that sense, we actually wanted to make use of the problems of word alignment that we cannot find good alignments for these uh, potential multi-word expressions. And you have here another example. You can see that uh, the, the word alignment procedures are very much confused. It aligns almost everything to everything. Um, which in this case for us I think was just a good thing because this is an indication that there's maybe something more going on than just simple word-to-word -word translations. So this is something that we want to use um, for, for uh, ranking and extracting possible candidates for idiomatic expressions. So we de defined some, some metrics that, that, that uh, actually try to measure these assumptions that we have uh, seen here. So we want to measure translation entropy to see how, how, what is the variation of, of translations that we can see, what is the alignment really looking like, is it very consistent or is it very inconsistent. So we defined this translation entropy measure and we also measured the proportion of, of default translations for each component. Yes. Sorry, I have a problem uh, understanding uh, your claim that uh, idiomatic uh, expressions are difficult to align. According to uh, a very popular definition, multi-word expressions are multi-word units having a clear separate meaning, uh, a meaning of their own. So this is in contradiction with your, uh, what you are saying that it's difficult to translate this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I agree to some extent. I think maybe this exactly this this meaning of multi-word expressions maybe don't exist exactly in the in the other language, and that that maybe is behind our assumption that you get a vari variety of different translations. But I, I see your point that maybe you have a very clear meaning that should also be very clearly translated and consistently in the other language. Yeah, so that's this, mm. this. This question is really about assumptions, which uh, mm -hmm. people sometimes. Uh, well put up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, a good question. I think our results show that this actually works, um, so I don't know why, but uh, let's see, we can, we can maybe have another uh, investigation on, on some other language pairs, for example. I think this is very language pair dependent maybe as well, so that you have clear dist uh, meanings that are represented by certain expressions or not. Or, well, I think this probably requires more investigations to verify. I think in our case it actually worked well for re-ranking. Um, I think the other metric is maybe a bit more intuitive. So I, do you also disagree with the other one? That is uh, that the uh, components do not translate to their default translations. I think this is the typical non-compositionality which I think is more intuitive. I think that, that at least we can probably agree on all of us or is there some other criticism here? Um, so I think that this, this measure of compositionality is probably uh, very re uh, uh, reasonable to assume that uh, the, the uh, components shouldn't really translate to their default translations and you can measure this non-compositionality by looking at uh, what it actually aligns to and, 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 and compute how much this di uh, differs from, from the default translations that you would get for the individual words. Okay, so that's what we used and then we had uh, we, we basically tested how, how this will perform 
and uh, so there was a PhD student there who was working on extracting these idiom idiomatic expressions from support verb constructions, um, and she used uh, just uh, monolingual association measures to find first some candidates which have high um, um, association between each other, and then this will be the baseline just below. So this is our baseline score for um, uh, a selection that we manually evaluated, I think 200 um, candidate expressions here. And then we used um, these metrics that we have defined before, the translation entropy and this PDA score, how we call it, um, um, to, to re-rank these candidates according to their um, compositionality, for example. So you can see that our uh, translation entropy scores work better than this uh, non-compositionality score for most of the cases which maybe contradicts our intuition here, but uh, somehow it worked out for at least uh, Dutch-German, which is also interesting because then you would assume that they are quite related to each other, but even there you seem to have a lot of variation. Um, Dutch-Spanish and Dutch-English, I think in all of them we well, almost all of them, we have the translation entropy performing quite well. But in general, both of them really give a big improvement over the ranking of possible idiomatic expressions. So I think that was a nice way of showing that the information, additional information coming from translation helped us here extracting uh, possible candidates. And uh, so she did her PhD on, on these extractions and, and uh, we were submitting then the uh, results to some lexicographer uh, to, to um, um, dictionary uh, producers and they were quite happy in getting this because they get a lot of more information from the data automatically ranked uh, in such a way that they can decide then manually if this is something to in introduce into the dictionaries or not. Okay, let's look at some examples. I'm sorry, this is in Dutch, so we did it for Dutch. So, so you have here a lot of these uh, possible uh, expressions based on support verb constructions and you can see here that this is the top ranked ones and okay means here that they are marked by manual evaluators as really idiomatic expressions, idiomatic meanings. So you can see the top 20 ones are really okay. It's, it's something that seems to be working well. Uh, in the middle range you see, so um, around 100 you see that there's a mixture so it becomes a bit more blurred and it, in the end you you basically have almost no multi-word expression or idiomatic expression in these candidates anymore. So I think this really worked well, surprisingly well maybe, um, according to what we have done, a very simple uh, way of, of measuring. So um, there was some follow-up work which unfortunately didn't result in a master's thesis yet. Um, that's always the problem if students get a job before finishing up. But there was someone uh, then we want to work on, on other data sets as well. So we did Europal and open subtitles and then just maybe also taking a, a subset of, of open subtitles. So movie subtitles, only fantasy movies. And you can get these things for different genres, for different uh, uh, domains. And you see what kind of results you can get here. So this is just some examples of things that you can extract with the same procedures ranking them based on these scores. Uh, and you can see that uh, also according to genres you have different types of expressions. Um, and you can judge yourself how much you think these are idiomatic or not. But uh, that's, that's something that you can really get from the data just purely looking at, at, at statistics and the translations. Okay. I still have time, good. So I want to go also a bit further than just looking at words. So this, this I think is a, a rather old work um, that many people have looked at, lexical semantics, getting information from translation. So now, now of course, it becomes interesting to go also on a sentence level and, and looking at representation learning. So here I come back to this picture again and this becomes interesting in, in relation to machine translation, especially in neural machine translation, because now we have the situation that neural MT tries to get some, some representation internally uh, that will be the intermediate representation when translating through, uh, well, from one language to another. So you have typically these encoder decoder structures um, where the encoder tries to get the symbols, the sentences as input, and then transforms this into some vector representation 
um, that seems that, that summarizes the uh, meaning behind the sentence. And then the decoder takes that representation and, and tries to generate a different language out of this. So now the interesting question is, of course, what kind of things are represented in this representation? So the question is really, can we make use of that representation in some other way than, than machine translation? Is, is there a way of, of uh, evaluating them or, or identify? Is, is this maybe a way of approaching really the, um, um, the abstractions that, that we need for, for understanding language? Is, is there some representation that really uh, refers to the meaning and not just a simple mapping between two languages? So this, this is some motivation um, that also, well, you can visualize, for example, these, these uh, vector spaces that are created. This is, of course, always a bit cherry picking and then just making some illustrations. So this comes out of a, a one of these standard um, papers on, on sequence to sequence models you can actually visualize that also the, models, the model really learns to put similar sentences in their similar spaces. Um, this is now taking only very few examples, but you can see also that there's a, a structure that you can see that similar things like uh, respecting uh, compared to love uh, is in, in similar distances in different versions of, of these sentences which have different um, agents or different people involved. Um, but you, you can, well, this may be not the best example to really show that there's some semantics behind it, but you hope that the, the system by, <coughs> by being forced to translate between two languages is now also forced to actually make some abstractions on, on a semantic level. <coughs> so, what I would be interested in is then how this uh, extends to multilingual representations. So if you now have two languages, then this internal representation maybe can do a lot of shortcuts because it can just literally, literally translate certain, certain words or uh, units. So, so this is again uh, some illustration to, to show what happens. So if you have individual models between uh, two languages, then you probably don't have to go that far up in, in this uh, in this triangle to get very high abstractions because you can do some shortcuts, very easy choices in doing translations. That's why also statistical MT worked that well because you, for related languages you don't have to make a lot of uh, uh, abstractions. So now the idea would be <coughs> if we have then uh, many different variants of, of, um, of the same sentence in different languages, for example, that really describe the variations and the uh, different expressions that can uh, correspond to the original sentence, then if the system has to use that kind of input to learn a system and to make the abstractions for all of them, we hope that uh, then this really pushes the system up to some, some, some increased abstraction that goes closer to, to meaning representations in this vector space. So this is my um, assumption here, so that enforcing to cover many languages would enforce it to make uh, stronger uh, um, abstractions that go to more some interlingua representations in, in this vector space. Is that intuitively okay? Or is there, yeah. So, this last is nice. So, of course, you want to end up with some impressive results. That's what I will try to do, but unfortunately, <laughs> I haven't got so far yet. Uh, so, this is something that I find really interesting, but I don't get, got, I didn't get any um, research funding for that yet. So, so that hopefully comes cl uh, soon that we have some projects running in this and then there's other projects running in the same directions. You can see there's a lot of interest in natural language inference, uh, natural language understanding, and, and there's a lot of similar ideas here. So now I think it is, it's always a problem here to, you have to act fast and uh, there's probably many people working in the same directions. Um, you have probably seen some, there was the Google paper where they hinted on some interlingua and that's the same idea here uh, that I presented here. Um, okay, but instead of presenting that, I have something else. <laughs> um, um, because we did some work on multilingual models and, and not really translation here, but we, we just want to see what can you actually do with a large data set of, of um, various different languages and, and can you train at least a language model over all these languages once uh, together and I created a language model that, that uh, captures all these different languages by just training on the sentences that, uh, that we have seen. It's a basic character based um, <coughs> language model that tries to predict the next character by giving the 
um, the previous history. And it's very straightforward and standard in, in, in nowadays in the technology that we have. So it uses recurrent neural, net, neural networks, um, two of these LSTM layers, and um, um, that's the typical thing like embedding characters into some, some uh, dense representation and then throwing them through these uh, RNNs, uh, predicting then the outputs, uh, basically doing this, this probabilistic prediction of the next character. So now the innovation here is that, um, well, just having many languages, we also wanted to, in the training phase, to, to show, to, to tell the system what kind of language is coming in. So there's, there's first a one hot uh, vector representation of these languages, but these will be also projected on, on some dense representation of a language. So we will get some language embeddings here, and that's the left-hand side, these, these meters. So we also learn the mapping of, of language to some, some kind of dense re vector representation of the languages. So we threw in uh, almost a thousand languages. Uh, so we threw in the Bible translations in 990 languages and language variants. First of all, to see is it really possible to train a language model on all these languages in one, th uh, so, so all together. Uh, so, so we basically have these translations of the New Testament, sometimes also the Old Testament. Um, and that this really learns then the, the, the basic uh, language uh, model parameters, but it also learns this language vector, these features, uh, the language feature which uh, um, activates what things to produce. And the first result is that this is actually possible, so you can throw those in, and it can, can capture most of the information that you have thrown in. Uh, so it, it really acts as, as a language model, and you can activate different languages. We can test that by generating text. So, so now we have some interesting examples here. Um, so you can just, for example, by turning on the Swedish language, the same language model now produces some, some kind of Swedish uh, Bible text. This is all Bible, of course, so it's a very narrow domain. Uh, you can turn on the German vector, and it produces German text. So it really switches over. It's the same parameter settings internally. It's only the language vector that comes into all these different places, turning on different things. So now the more interesting thing is because you have now language vectors, this some, some kind of space, you can also mix them. So you can also do some intermediate representations. And if you, for example, mix Swedish and German, just making the average of those, um, I really like this kind of example here where you get this nonsense uh, language that you get out. You can really create your own language, basically. Uh, it looks to me like Swedish with the German morphology. Uh, I, I can really uh, recognize some, some aspects of the two languages. So in some sense, you can see that the, the system really learns something. You have the mixture of the Scandinavian languages, and it's really a nice mixture of Icelandic and Norwegian and Danish and Swedish uh, to some extent. So, so this is really interesting just from a fun point of view. Um, this is the continuous language space. As you can see, it makes sense. Uh, the 990 languages, but now if you get a little closer, it really tries, so basically just looking at the data, it tries to put those languages that are related to each other quite close to each other. So now this is projected to do two dimensions. Um, so you have to take this with a grain of salt. And it's also making, of course, some, some things that are not completely correct, but you can see that things become quite close to each other, which should be quite close to each other. So because if you activate that language, it's not very far from each other. The parameters would be similar to the ones that you need for the related language. So this is, I think, interesting from a linguistic point of view. You can actually figure out the relations between languages by just throwing the data at the model. Uh, you can plot, for example, some, some uh, uh, clustered um, visualization on that, and you can see that this becomes a language tree that looks quite familiar. There's, there's, of course, not everything correct, but from our point of view, very simple model learns quite a lot of interesting genetic uh, relations between languages. And, and just plotting here the Germanic languages, I think there's, there's a lot of um, truth behind these relations here. And this is basically just using this language space that we have created. So, of course, looking at more, you can see more other things, and we don't really want to look at all the details, but you can see that uh, for larger languages, this becomes a bit more tricky then, of course. Um, so you have some things that go wrong, and I know I haven't really looked at this too much. Uh, English and French, for example, are put quite close to each other, and this is probably due to all these lexical borrowings that you have in English. <coughs> there are some other interesting cases. Well, you have Estonian and Finnish close to each other, but then rather close to uh, Romance languages. I don't know if that could be some, some interesting 
um, linguistic typology <laughs> for someone. But I think this is just basically a first attempt to see what, what can be learned from these data sets. Uh, one, one other interesting, do I have to stop soon? Oh. Okay, so I can also go into this one example that we actually looked at. So if you interpolate between languages, we also have different language variants in the Bible uh, translations here. So we have, for, for example, historical variants like Middle English, and we can compare to Modern English. And then we interpolate, just randomly um, generate some text again. You can see what happens here. Um, so you go from, I don't know, I don't speak Middle English. Is, does it look like Middle English? Um, so this generated text from that model and it becomes more and more modern English if you get closer to the modern English language vector. So this is, this is just to uh, show you some examples. Let's plot some cross entropy uh, figures here. So if you mix between German and English, the expected thing happens that if, if you go from English more towards German, then the fit of some, some held out English test data is not as good any, as, uh, anymore as in the beginning. So it flips over at uh, 0.5, uh, between 0.4 and 0.6 somehow. You can see it becomes then really the German language model that doesn't really fit the English text that well. But the interesting picture I think is on the right hand side. So if we mix between Middle English and Modern English, and our held out test set is the King James Bible, which is from a period somewhere in between. Um, so, so now if we measure the cross entropy here, this intermediate language uh, model that is around 0.5 here has a slightly better cross entropy uh, on this King James Bible than, than the other two parts would have. So that means that somehow the, the, the intermediate uh, representations are somehow covered by this uh, mixture of, of languages. I think that is a very interesting result here. Now, again, this you have to be careful here. This is only very uh, slight improvements only, but I think it shows some potentials that you can, I don't know if you can even recreate some, some kind of language that you don't have any data for. You generate something that is historically in between, or at least attempt to do it um, uh, in some way. So I can see some interesting research coming out of this. Okay, so I finish up. What I wanted to say is that implicit linguistics somehow, if you just use data, is really interesting. You can really find interesting distributional patterns um, without having any supervision or annotation. Um, we have shown, well, we, you can show these uses for lexico-semantic relations, and we have shown these, these kind of um, language vectors that you can learn by purely looking at data sets without having uh, specific um, expert knowledge actually coming in. Um, and the interesting thing, I think, what we want to um, use work on on more is these these massive because then you have all these linguistic diversity um, in in one big data set, and and I can imagine a lot of different interesting things that you can get out of, out of this. So instead of using these these five to ten languages that usually people look at because there's enough data data for these uh, common languages available, we would like to look at hundreds and thousands language of languages to, to learn something interesting from that. So, and this, my idea here is again that if we, for example, look at these multilingual representations and we have a large variety and, uh, of, of languages in the data set, then we probably can get to a very nice abstractions. The, the problem is only how, how do we measure what, what that actually represents. So, with that, I think I'm done. Thank you. So, <coughs> questions? Questions? Just one. Andras Kornay from Budapest. Of clarification, you had uh, some slides, but you went over them very fast on how you uh, derived the multilingual model. Uh, f uh, yes. No. No. <laughs> this one. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, could could you elaborate on this process a little bit? Um, okay. Yes. Um, so this is um, a stacked LSTM recurrent neural network language model. Um, so this this has these two layers of uh, LSTMs. Uh, which are the recurrent part, and then you have in the input um, from the above, you would have characters that will be first embedded into some 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 character embeddings, um, and then you add. This will be input to each um, 
position at this, this recurrent network. The first one. And then you also add the first part of this language vector to that input. So this goes into the first uh, LSTM, uh, which is then going through. And the output of these um, different LSTM units, they go to the second LSTM where the second part of the language vector goes in. Um, and this then again produces some, some output, so some magic, uh, and, and, and sends this further to the next positions. And then the output layer then this, this uh, maps back to characters via some softmax layer, uh, where you try then to map the output of all these processing to the uh, predictions of the characters, then the, the next character given some history. So if you have the first position, then the, well, the first position is the, the history of, of, of predicting the second character, for example. And then it ac accumulates all the information in the recurring network, and then tries to predict the next character based on, on the entire history um, plus these language vectors. And so how, how do you get a langu language like Chinese into this? You're using pinyin or? Ah yeah, so that's, that's a good uh, question. So, so what we did is we selected uh, 990 languages and language variants where we have, we, we didn't do any normalization of the alphabet, we're just throwing in the characters, so Chinese is not in here, but we, uh, we uh, excluded, we, we stopped when we had more than 1,000 symbols. So we didn't even map uh, Cyrillic to alpha to Latin characters or something. So there will be different embeddings for Cyrillic and, and, and Greek characters. And th but there's no, well, we stopped when this becomes over some, some limits that we set. So we didn't have the entire collection, but only a limited set. And what we didn't, so what we should do is, is doing some, maybe some, some mapping between obvious transliterated characters, for example. But it could be also, what we also didn't do is maybe the system actually learns that these characters are very similar. So you could also look at the character embeddings and to see if, if an alpha would be close to A, uh, for example. Maybe that's another, another interesting thing that you could check if the model actually learns that. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Has this been published? Is there like a write-up on this somewhere? Yes, there's a paper at ESL just a week ago or so. Short paper, <laughs> so it's not that detailed. <laughs> Just a short comment. I like how your language hierarchy insulted the Serbians and the Croatians because those were the two languages grouped the earliest. Yeah. Okay. I should have. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, no, there's a lot of. <coughs> this is by far not. Perfect. So really, the first attempt to do something, but we were surprised to see that a lot of I intuitive things come out, but there are a lot of strange things come out as well. Um, so it, I think it requires some more work to to see what is happening here and what is actually represented. Um, is it lexical um, information that is or phonetic information that is most important? I don't know yet. Hmm? No. With the original I wonder how the whole interpolation then works, or generation. I mean, it, was, it will generate half Cyrillic and half Latin. Yeah. So I, I can maybe let me see. I, we can we can play around with this in the break, um, and we can just generate some arbitrary mixtures. I did so. For example, what I did also, I did. Should I stop? Um, yes. No. So just some. Just out of, out of curiosity, for example, I subtracted English from Afrikaans, and from my point of view, it looked more Dutch. But I don't know if this really makes any sense. But uh, so, so, but you can do these things. Uh, for example, also I extracted, well, I subtracted Fren the French vector from English, and, and thought that maybe the the French influence would go away. But it looked really weird. What comes out from that? I think the Afrikaans minus English would make more sense. Somehow, but you can have these mixtures, and and see what happens. So, uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Now, next persons will want to start the uh, talk. Actually, the one who already couldn't hold his tongue and already started your dis uh, discussion, Mark, will be in the next one. But well, uh, this is yeah. Something for you from the local organizers Whoa. who gave me, I don't know what is there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. 
And so, uh, according to the timetable, next one will be Mark Fischel, Neuromachine Tulge. Kas mind on kuulda? Tere päevast! Ma räägin aeglaselt ja lihtsalt. Sellega aeglane ja lihtne kõne lõpeb ja siis tere, ma olen Mark Fischel ja räägin teile Eesti keeletehnoloogia projektis kasutatav Eesti masintõlge või ehk lõhidalt kama. Ning üldiselt projekti eesmärgid olid tõsta eesti keelest ja eesti keelde masintõlge kvaliteeti üldiselt ja konkreetsemalt võimaldada masintõlge praaktilist kasutamist eestis ja eesti keele puhul nii erakasutajatele ehk siis üldmõttest aru saamise eesmärgil kui ka ärikasutajatele selleks, et sellega saaks teha järeltoemetamist. Need eesmärgid ei muutunud ja jätki samaks, mis muutus on see metodoloogia, mida me kasutame. Alguses siis me tegelesime statistiliste süsteemidega, statistilise masintõlkega aastate 2015-2016. Jätes vahele väga palju detaile, siis me kõigepealt panime püsti baas süsteeme ning tegime hästi palju parandusi nende peale, et näiteks eesti keelsed liitsõnad jagasime mõnikord osadeks, üritasime järjekorda tõsta ja nii edasi ja siis natuke parandust me saime küll. Üld järjeldus oli see, et süsteemid ja nende väljund on kasutatavad rangel piiratud valdkondades. Näiteks tehnilised tekstid, näiteks üriidilised tekstid, et neid oli mõtted näiteks järjel toimetada ja üldmõttes saab kindlasti aru, kui rääkida üldisemast valdkonnast. Kuigi üldiselt on ikkagi nende välju on selline katkine ja Eesti sõnade vahel üldivus, kas puudub või longab ja järjekord tõlkides, kas eesti keelest inglise keelde, inglise keelest eesti keelde, sõnade järjekord praktiselt ei muutu. Et kui ühe keele sõnad või fraasid olid siis mitte loomulikus järjekorras teise keele suhtes, siis ümber paigutamine kuidagi sellega hakkama ei saanud. Ja üks tüüpiline näide on siin lähte lausega But thanks to the good cooperation between Parliament and the Commission and the Member States, at the end we have got that agreement. Aha. Tõlge on, kuid tänu hea koostöö parlamenti ja komisjoni vahel ja liikmesriikides on meil lõpuks, on see kokkulepe. Te näete, et parlamenti, komisjoni ja liikmesriikide vahel see pikema, see pikem suhe siin ei kajastu ja vahel läks kusagile vahele ja üldiselt ühildust ühilduvus siin ka eriti ei ole. Ja siis möödunud aastal lülitusime ümber tehisne ärvivõrkude põhiste masintelke süsteemide peale. Praegu jõudsime nii kaugele, et ehitasime baassüsteeme kõike olemas olevate andmetega, Jõudsime natuke neid torgate vaadata, kuidas neid natuke paremaks saab, aga üldiselt on seal tööd küll ja küll ja sellest natuke räägin. Euro masin tõlgega on sellised, et kõigepealt väljund on üldiselt palju, palju sorvam kui statistilise masin tõlge puhul. Lihtsalt see tõttu, et kui statistiliste süsteemidega näiteks sõnad laud, laua ja laul on kõik lihtsalt erinevad sõnad ja laud ja laua 
sarnasus on sama sugune kui laud ja laul, siis neurovõrkute süsteemidega nagu Jörg ka praegu näitas, et iga sõna jaoks on see kõrgidimensionaalne vektor ja neid leitakse sellisteks, et laud ja laua vektorid on hästi lähedal ja laul sõna vektor on kusagil mujal. See ka selline pehmem või pidevama jaotusega lähenemine tagab seda, et tegelikult süsteem oskab seda nii ühilduvust kui muud stiili ja konteksti modelleerida. Küll, aga pikemate lausete tõlge on ikkagi probleemiks ning suureks probleemiks on vastavus sisendile. Kui ma nüüd loen ette seda näid, et siis meie neurosüsteem kus sisend on eesti keelne, Tartu Ülikooli arvuti teatus instituudi keeletehnoloogid on valmis saanud uuendusliku eesti keelse masintõlgi töörist, aga see on kesmise pikkusega lause, siis tõlge on The University Institute of Tartu University Institute's language technologies have been completed in an innovative front load of the work crisis. Suure fõnglise keel, et nagu grammatiline lause, aga siis sisendile ta eriti ei vasta. Mis siis juhtub nende neurovõrgude süsteemide sees? Kõigepealt tehniline slaid, mida me täpselt hetkel kasutame, on see encoder-decoder lähenemine koos tähelepanu mehanismiga, mille pildi te nägite ka Jörgi slaidides, selleks, et emite genereerida hästi palju sõnasid, mis tähendavad tunmatu sõna, tunmatu sõna, tunmatu sõna. Me segmenteerime sõnu tükkideks kasutades bytepeer kodeerimist ja treenimiseks kasutasime palju paraleelkorpusi või rõõbkorpusi nagu Euroopa Parlamenti istungite tekstid ja siis Open Subtitles, mida juba mainiti siin mitu korda ja Jörgi pool tehtud, Euroopa Parlamenti digitaalkorpus ja teised. Kokku on natukele 15 miljoni lause paari või siis 183 miljonit inglise ja 143 miljonit eesti sõnet. Ja lõpuks kasutasime valmis avaliku lähtekoodiga Tarkvara nemadus selleks süsteemi treenida ja Amu NMT jookseb meil serverites selleks, et kiiresti tõlkida. Ja siis kuidas see neuromasindelge töötab ja miks ta mõnikord otsustab räägida samal teemal kui mitte sama sisendiga? Selleks see sellist süsteemi ehitada, me alustame nende lausete ja nende tõlgede paaridega ja siis paraleelkorpustega. Siis me põhimõtteliselt mõtselt võtame neurovõrgude põhist keelemudelid, mida saab õpetada järgmisi sõnu üks haaval ennustama või genereerima ja siis anname talle lisasisendid, mis on siis see lähtekeele lause. Ja see järel me õpetame teda siis vaadates lähtekeele lausede ennustama väljundi sõnu üks haaval. Ta võib seda lisasisendide siis lähtekeele laused vaadata, aga ta ei pruugi seda vaadata. Seega kui lähtekeele lauses on haruldasi sõnu või midagi kahtlast või midagi tundmatud, ta võib lihtsalt otsustada selle asemel kasutada mingid väga soravad väljendid kusagilt mõeld. Ning seda siib põhimõtteliselt see keele muda lisasisendiga ongi meie neuromasin tõlge süsteem. Kui me võrdleme kvaliteedi poolest neurovõrgude statistilisi süsteemi, kõigepealt statistilisel on väga lihtne töödelda sellised asju nagu numbrid või nimed, et kui ta ei tunne seda numbrid, siis ta lihtsalt õstab seda väljundisse, numbrid tõlkime ei pea, lõpptulmus on õige. Siis veel üks asjaol on see, et meil on garanteeritud, et sisendi lause saab kaetud. Ehk siis kõik sisend lause juppid saavad tõlgitud väljundisse. Mida kahjuks ei saa garanteerida neurovõrgid? Nad ei pruugi seda katta ja sagedamini esinevaid numbreid, aasta numbreid tõlgitakse õigesti, harvemini esinevaid numbreid nagu eile Wikipedia workshopil me nägime, siis aasta arv 1962, väga raske asi tõlgimiseks, tõlgiti aastaks 1947, jah, et tähendab, see mõjutab isegi väga palju, see mõjutab kõige rohkem inimeste arvamus nende süsteemide kohta, et süsteem, sa suudad seda konteksti ja stiili modeleerida, aga aasta numbrid ei suuda nagu korrektselt tagada, seega see kahjustab nagu mained või järel toimetamise kiirust. Teises küll ja statistilise süsteemide puhul sõnade järjekord on suureks probleemiks, väga tihti, 
kui see erineb siht lähtekeeles ja siht keeles selle ümber paigutamisega, kui laus on kesmise või kesmise pikkusega või veelgi pikem, sellega nad väga tihti hakkama ei saa. Ja muidugi morfoloogiliselt rikkaste keelde morfoloogiline ühilduvus on väga suureks probleemiks. Võtakse valmis fraase, neid taas kasutatakse, fraasi sees on kõi kõige fraaside vahel mingisugust sünergiad või sellist ühilduvust modeleeritakse väga-väga nõrgalt ja lõpuks väljund on selline katkine, morfoloogiliselt väga ebagramaatiline. Võrreldes sellega neurovõrkude väljund on siis, ta on sorav ja ta on gramaatiline enamasti ja sõnade järjekord on hea, sest süsteemid ei ei genereeri seda nii lineaarselt vaadates sisendid. Nad lihtsalt genereerivad väljundid ja nad võivad vaadata sisendid ükskõik kuhu, kas või korraga terved, kas või niimoodi üksikute juppide kaupa. Nii, aga muidugi, kui me tõlgime pikemaid lauseid, siis väga tihti statistilises süsteemidega te saate spagetid. Kui te hoopis tõlgite need pikemaid lauseid nervovõrkude süsteemidega, siis te ikka saate spagetid. Enamasti. Nii, tõlge näite, et ma ei tea, kas siit on, ei mitte siit, seal on näha. See oli hea näide neurovõrgude suhtes, et kui siis statistiline ütleb, uus protokoll nüüd meile esitanud komissioni poolt on väga ranke kärpeid võrreldes vana, üldus puudu, järjekord sassis ja neurovõrg oskab öelda, et uus protokoll, mida komission nüüd meile esitab, kujutab endast väga rangeid kärpeid võrreldes vana korraga. No see koordsõna on natuke mööda, aga muidu täiesti hea. Siis... Siis see oli pigem see naljakas lause, kus neuroma siin tõlge kuidagi ei saa sellega hakkama. Lähte lause, as many of you know, John Bowies was taken ill recently in Brussels and was hospitalized. Ja siis statistilise masin tõlge väljund on väga hea. Neuro asja ütleb, et nagu paljud teist teavad, kasutati John Bowies eele Brüsselis haigestuda ja see oli ravitav. No, ta nagu... Sarnaselt selle nende roheliste värvitute ideedega, mis raevakult magavad, gramaatiline struktuur siin nagu on, aga tähendust kuidagi puudu. Ja siis muidugi nimedega, see on see sama probleem kui numbritega, et kui meil sisendis on näiteks nimi Härra Jürg, siis meie neurosüsteemil tundus, et seda peab tõlkima nagu Mr. Bupui statistiline, aga saab sellega ilusesti hakkama. Nüüd nii palju siis nendes neuromasin tõlge süsteemidest endast. Mida muud, siis me just kävitesime neurotõlge.ee demo veebilehe, kus seda saab tõlkida ja kohe näitan mingid statistikat, sest sealt me korjasime nagu võrdlusi. Siis subtiidrid, mida te minu paremal ja vasakol näete ja Siis Vaidlen vastu neile, kes ütlevad, et ta masin tõlge oli aeglane ja sellepärast ei saa seda elusalt niimoodi näidata, et päris sünkroonselt. Probleem on pigem selles, et kui me iga sekundi tagant uuendame mitte ainult eesti keelt, vaid inglise keelt, siis see hakkab hõppama sinna ja tagasi väga drastiliselt. Et kõne tuvastus on enne vähem selline monotoonne, lineaarne, et kui me parandame midagi pärast, siis me parandame viimased kaks-kolm sõna. Ma siin tõlge juures, ta hakkab terved lauset muutma iga sekundi tagant ja siis te lihtsalt ei suudaks seda lugeda. Ja võibolla vahe tee oleks seda ouendada iga kolme, nelja, viie sekundi tagant, aga noh, selline eks jõuame. Siis üks kõrval eesmärk sellel kama projektil oli käivitada koostööprojekti ja see oli täiesti läinud edukalt, sest meil nüüd on käivitamas täismahuline koostööprojekti. Enne seda tegime pilootprojekti ja siis nemad tahavad kindlasti neurosüsteeme. Ja siis kõrk hariduse asutus, et nagu Tartu oli kool Tallinna oli kool Tallinna Tehnik oli kool, see sisekaitse akadeemia ja siis kaitsevägi ja majandus, ei, maaülikool ja teised, ta tõlkida õppekavasid, aine kavasid ja siis nende jaoks me teeme ka põhimõtteliselt ühse süsteemi, et tõlkida eesti keelest inglis keelde ja tagasi. Nagu Polonia süsteem teiste keelde jaoks, aga siis eesti inglise. Ja üks asi, mida me kävitasime lisaks tõlge teemale sinna neurotolge eesse, on see, et kasutajad võivad vajutada nõpumängi ja siis nad saavad kolm tõlget erinevatelt süsteemidelt meie oma, tilde oma ja Google oma ja ilma, tähendab, järjekord on lampis genereeritud ja kasutele ei öelda 
kumb on kumb. Ja siis selleks, et teada kumb on kumb, kasute peab palima parimat tõlget ja alles siis näidatakse. Siis statistika, mida ma eilse tänase või eesmaspäevas, kui nii tänase päeva nii sain, oli see, et meie oma ja Google statistiline Eesti inglis, inglis Eesti tõlge sai umbes 37% ja midagi ja siis tilde oma kuidagi sai vähemini. Nüüd Tilde oma töötab samamoodi neurovõrkodega, ta kasutab sama lähenemist nii palju kui ma tean ja kasutab kindlasti rohkem andmeid. See ka lihtsalt ei tunduks, et ma siin sõiman tilded. Ma olen väga palju näinud tilde tõlkeid, mis tunduvad tulevad tehnilistest manuaalidest. Ma oletan, et see on väga suur kasutajas, kui on tilde jaoks ja kas nüüd süsteem on meelega häälestatud selle valdkonna peale või lihtsalt neid andmeid oli rohkem ja süsteem lihtsalt nende lausetega, mida sinna internetist opitakse, lihtsalt noota ei ole selleks mõeldud. Ma siin tõlge on kasutada fainult siis, kui ta on nagu häälestatud valdkonnale ja nii edasi mitte luule või siis ilukirjanduse tõlgeks. Ma oletan, et selles on siis see küsimus siin. Ja kui me vaatame tõlgekvaliteedi jagatuna lause pikkuste järgi, siis siis laused, mis on kaheks või kuni seitse sõna pikad, tegelikult saavad kõige paremat tõlged googlid, mis on imelik sellepärast, et neurosüsteemid tegelikult peaksid saama nendega ilusasti hakkama. Natuke pikemalt laused kaheksast, viie teiskümne, nii siis nagu te näete, töö on teistest kõrgem ja ülejäänudel pikematel lausedel kvaliteed on enam vähem sama. See ka alates kolmekümneste näete seda spagettid põhimõtteliselt, et nii suurt vahet neuro ja statistilise vahel või siis meie tilde vahel ei olegi. Nii, aga mis puutub tuleviku alusuuringute vallas kindlasti tegelema tõlgekvaliteedi parandamisega, kus on plaan suurendada paraleel andmestike sünteesitud andmete kasutamise teel, ehk siis me võtame ühekeelseid andmeid ja siis sünteesime nende sisendi osa ja siis kasutame neid lisa treenimismaterjalidena. Ja siis väga rumal ja lihtne igav asi, mida kindlasti peab ära tegema, on see, et tõlgiks numbreid numbriteks ja nimesi tõigeteks nimeteks, sest see ei ole see põnev osa, kus teeme vinged neurovõrga, mis midagi automaatselt, aga see on see osa, mida on vaja selleks, et meid ei sõimaks postimees, et me tõlgime midagi valesti. Siis, mis puutub seda demosüsteemi, kindlasti peab sinna lisama teisi keeli, nagu Eesti, Vene, Eesti, Eesti, Läti, Eesti, Eesti, Soome, Eesti. Ja muidugi see ei ole avalik teema, aga peab Taneliga rääkima, et äkki ta oleks nõus, kas nüüd meile lubata tema apit kasutada kõneliideseks või vähemalt meile käivitada tema mudeleid. Ja api tegelikult on meil juba käimas, et kui keegi tahab seda programmeerimisliidesest kasutada ja kindlasti oleme avatud koostööprojektide suhtes. Ja kokku võteks, üldiselt ütleks, et masin tõlge sai kasutada omaks, aga arvestades, et neurovõrgud alles hakkasid tõlgima paar aastat tagasi, et see on hästi ebastabiilne ja selle asemele toodata halvema grammatika ja sooravusega väljundid, selle asemele ootame laused, mis on oopis mingisugusel muul teemal. Ja ühesõnaga me töötame selle kallal. Siin ma lõpetan, võite lugeda ühte, et naljakamat näidet meie tõlgesüsteemist, aga ma tänan teid tähelepanu eest ja hea meelega vastan küsimustele. Ja mul on selline küsimus, et närvivõrke kasutades, kui tõlgitakse ühest jäldes teise, siis kas on, kuidagi tuleb ka kõne alla see, et võetakse juurde veel mingi kolmas või neljas keel sinna abiks, selleks, et saada parem tõlge närvivõrkud põhiselt? Jah, seda on tehtud ja see tõstab kvaliteeti, et see on pigem selline teadusuurimise suhtes huvitav asi, aga ma ei kutsu, et praktilist kasutusjuhtumid, et kus meil oleks nagu võtta mõlemad keeld ja siis tõlkida kolmandasse. Pivoting, sa mõtled seda, et teiste keelt ei kaudu. 
Ah, ei, ja neil on üks neurovõrk, mis oskab kõike neid kiili. Aha. See on vist midagi mõjud. Kas te mõtlete seda, et me anname sisendiks Eesti ja vene keelde ja tõlge inglise keelde? Ei, seda ma ei mõelnud. Ah, te mõtlesidki seda, et üks mudel saab hakkama nii Eesti kui vene kui Läti kui Tõsti? Ei, ma ei, pegelt pigem see esimene sõhmas, et ma mõtlesin seda, et ühest keelest õigitakse teise, aga siis veel lisatakse veel kolmas juurde selleks, et kvaliteedi parandada. Kas seda tehaks üldse küsimus? Ah, et te mõtlete siis Eesti keelest soome keelde ja soome keelest inglise keelde? Ei, ütleme, et mu mõte ongi selles, et kas tehaks kasutatakse sellist lähenusi, et võetakse mingi teine keel kõrvale selleks, et kvaliteeti parandada. Ütleme, kolmas keel võetakse kõrvale. Tahad eesti keelest inglis keelde tõlkida, aga võetakse veel soome keel sinna juurde, et saada parem kvaliteet. Aga siis ma ikka vastasin õigeti, aga Martinil oli kommentaar. Tahtasin teenda, et mis on kasutatav on, on see, et võetakse teise paradigmaga masintõlke süsteeme juurde, ehk statistilisi ja reelite põhisi hübriide saada, et see elab kõige parem tulemast. Minu teada Googlil on mitmed keeled ka neuratõlke peal ja seal on mitme keelne tõlke mudel ja ma arvan, et see ongi just sellepärast niimoodi, et et erinevad keeled siis aitavad üksteist ka kaasa. Ei, Google on muidugi palju vingem, tähendab, neil on kõigepeal see sümbol tasemel, teiseks kõik need keeled lähevad ühe muudali sisse ja selleks, et noh, ütleme, kui me õppisime eesti keelest inglis keelde tõlkida ja veel vene keelest ukraina keelde, siis vene keeles saab inglise keelde juba tõlkida ilma nende paare nägemata põhimõtteliselt. Ja ainus põhjus, miks me siin nii uhked oleme, et me oleme neurovõrk ja siis Google on statistiline, on lihtsalt see, et Google prioriteedide nimekirjas on eesti keel kosekil alla poole ja nad lihtsalt ei jõudnud meie keeleni veel, aga küll nad varsti jõuad. Peame kiirustama ise ka. Ei ole. Täna on siis tähelepanu eest. Ja nüüd peaks siis esinema Peeb Küngas, isikute organisatsioonide nimede lahendamine Eesti veebis. Aha, olemas. Nii, mina olen Peeb Küngas, mina töötan Tartu Ülikoolis Arvutiteadus instituudis ja minu südame asjaks on andmete kasutamine ja keeletehnoloogia rakendamine. Andmete kasutamise seisukohalt minu meest on üks sellised palju lubavamaid tehnoloogiad, mis on suht alakasutatud hetkel. Ja käesoleva projekti raames ma olen proovinud veidikene siis pakkuda laendusi, et kuidas tõst tõsta siis teha keeletehnoloogiate rakendamine laiemalt kasutatavaks. Ja selles ka siis idee sellise pilvedaristu loomiseks, mis siis lihtsustaks just nimelt andmete kasutamist, aga nende andmete kasutamist, mille kasutamine hetkel ei ole lihtne ja kus keeletehnoloogia rakendamisel on perspektiivi. Ja kus see probleem pihta hakkab? Ta hakkab pihta meie veebist, online meediast, mis on siis viimast aastate jooksul tegelikult alates 80-test isegi stabiilselt ja pidevalt kasvanud. Aja jooksul on tulnud uusi kanaleid, selle pildi peal me näeme siin, ütleme, Twitter ja Facebook on sellised nii-öelda suhteliselt vanad kanalid juba, aga neid kanalid tuleb niimoodi aegelt juurde. 
mis siin on võibolla uuema täki, on, on Instagram, mis ei ole ka tegelikult väga uus. E-posti kanal on aasta kümneid vana. Mida siin hetkel ei ole, on, on veeb, aga veeb kasvab enam vähem samast, samast tempos. Et lihtsalt võibolla täienduseks selle graafiku juurde siis, siis iga minuti jooksul luuakse, registreeritaks ligi 200 uut veebi domeeni ja sellega seoses ja, ja teiste kanalite kaudu ka samamoodi tuleb uut sisu veebi juurde. Ja kui vaadatu nüüd andmeid, mis andmete maailmas toimub, siis, siis veidike on hakkanud tõusma struktureeritud andmete nii-öelda loomine. Aga, aga see, mis nii-öelda veebis laiale on, kas HTML lehtedena või, või mõningate muude dokumentidena, see on, see on hakkanud moodustama sellist nii-öelda väga kiiresti kasvatud tulka andmetest, mis on veebis kätte saadavad. Ja, ja selle kasutusele võtmiseks väga häid lahendus ei ole, Ja, ja minu enda ootused on, on suunatud keeletehnoloogia poole, et, et võtta seda siis kasutusele, et struktureerinud andmetesse niimoodi struktuuri tuua. Aga motivatsiooni poole pealt on olemas veel kolmas komponent, et samal ajal, kui me näeme, et ta andmete maht meil kasvab, struktureerimata andmete maht kasvab veel kiiremini, me samal ajal ei teki kompetentsi, mis võimaldaks struktureerimata andmetega ja suures maus andmetega tööd teha. Seda me näeme erinevatest uuringutest, mis toovad välja näiteks IT-tööjõu ja, ja muu seotud oskustega inimeste puuduse erinevatel turgudel, nii Euroopa Liidus kui, kui Ameerika ühendriikides. Ja, ja sellest nii lähtudes, nii see vajadus, majanduslik majandus on, on siis lihtsustada struktureerimata andmete kasutamist ja, ja see on siis see pidevunkt jääsalve projekti jaoks. Projekt ise sai algatatud kaks aastat tagasi. Esialgseks partneriks oli majanduskommunikatsiooniministeerium. Praeguseks hetkeks on, on siia kõrvaldunud Häri Ühing, Registar OÜ. Paljud inimesed teavad seda Inforegister saidi kaudu. Osad teiste teenuste kaudu võib-olla ka. Ja nendega koos toimub siis nii-öelda peamiselt nende tulemuste kasutusel võtmine. Et see, ja, ja selle nii-öelda väljundi valideerimine siis ka. Aga projekti enda, enda eesmärgiks on siis luua pilveplatform, mis korjab veebist ise andmeid. Ta ei hakka ootama, et kasutajadele midagi ette söödab, vaid ta, ta juba nii vaatab, mis on veebis olemas. Eraldab seal tekstilise osa ja, ja siis teeb selle programmide teadlaste ja teiste jaoks kasutamiseks, ilma, et nad peaksid hakkama seda kohe küsima ja andmeid töötlema selleks, et neid kasutusel võtma. Ja, ja miks ta niimoodi oluline on, on eelkõige see võib-olla, et nagu eelnevalt vainisin, et ühelt poolt inimeste kompetents ei jõua kiiresti järele. Ta avaldub võib-olla keeletehnoloogide juures sellisel kujul, et, et kui sul annete mahtlab suuremaks, siis ei ole sellist häid tööriist, mis suudaks nendega väga hästi toime tulla. Ja, ja nii-öelda, ütleme, teistes Sama on ka tegelikult tööstuse poole pealt, ega, ega suurte andmevahtudega ei ole sellist head kompetentse Eestis olemas, et keegi suudaks nendega tööd teha. Eesti veeb on Eesti suurim andme, andme komplekt, kui seda niimoodi vaadata. Okei, okay, projektiga on seotud eelnevalt keeletehnoloogia projektidest. Ma tooksin välja võibolla siis püütune tegid keeletehnoloogia jaoks, eelkõige morfoloogiline analüüs ja, ja nimega üksesse tuvastamise teek. 57. Projekti, projekti juures on tegemis sellega. Ja siis on olemas Euroopa Liidu projektide juures tekinud projektid Anno Market, kus siis on vaadeldud selliste nii teenuste põhiste, aga, aga just nii tekstil annoteerimise teenuste nii tükeldamise mehanisme, et kuidas neid teha tükkideks ja teenuste on välja anda. P3C juures on olemas eraldi töögrupp, mis on loodud selleks, et, et keele, keeltehnoloogia ressurside kirjeldamise jaoks luues referentsmudeleid, neid me kasutame oma projektis. Ja, ja siis nii sisendina on veel teised projektid, mida me siis kasutame kas kaudselt või, või otseselt. Meeskonnas läbi aja olen olnud mina ja Kaarel Tõinsson. Vahepeal 2015. aastat oli kaasatud ka Pelle Jakovits ja, ja üks, üks mu magistrantidest, kes kahjuks eelmisel aastal, õnneks, ütleme, tema, tema rõõmuks eelmisel aastal lõpetaks, minu, minu nagu suureks kurvastuseks enam, enam selle projektiga kaas ei tulnud. 
Okei, okay, aga nagu eelnevalt võib olla mainitud, kui ma rääkisin, et, et, et see lähenemine on selles, et, et me võtame terve Eesti veebinevad ette, me valmistame selle kasutades keeletehnoloogeid lihtsasti söödavaks ja töödeldavaks, siis see lähenemine on, on pigem selline pidev, et selle projekti raames, mis me oleme teinud, võtnud eesmärgiks, on panna tööle siis Eesti veebi regulaalne arhiveerimine, ehk siis iga regulaalse intervalli tagant me me siis salvestame hetke seisu Eesti veebist, me eraldame Eesti veebist teksti, tekstidest tuvastame olemid ja, ja siis olemid me siis lahendame ära, ehk siis nimega üksus, et proovime leida nendele vasted, siis konkreetselt konkreetsetele objektide reaalsest elust, ehk nii-öelda täpsemalt see, millest see, millest Nende käesolav aastaskoop meil oli, oli seotud isikute ja, ja firmade nimede lahendamine, eks siis nende konkreetse identiteediga sidumine. Aga kui minna võidike laiemaks, siis aadresside puhul näiteks, kui, kui tekstis on mainitud näiteks Piru 3, Tallinn näiteks, siis, siis selle nii see olem, mille vastu seda lahendatakse, on näiteks aadressandmete registris vastava aadressobjekti objekti identifikaator. Et see on siis see eelviimane samm selles selle nii-öelda infrastruktuuri juures. Ja kõige viimane samm on siis puhastatud töödeldud almete kodeerimine ja publiseerimine sellisel kujul, et neid saaksid lihtsalt kasutusel võtta. Ja, ja praktikas ta tähendab siis erinevad rakendusliidased ja, ja andme kohaselt. Käesolava aasta peamine tulemus on, on siis Apache Spark raamistikul põhinev lahendus, mis on siis mõeldud nimeküksuste tuvastamiseks. Ja, ja, ja ta kasutab tegelikult ütleme, est, est ennelt ka projekti teeki, mis, mis on tema erinevus sellest on see, et, et see raamistik niimoodi võimaldab arutusi teha siis Hadoop klastrite peal, ehk siis suure mahuliste andmeid töötlemiseks saab seda kasutada. Ja, ja täiendavalt siis Apache Spark raamistiku peal, Apache Spark on üks pilvearutuse mudeleid, mida, mida kasutatakse siis suurte andmete töötlemiseks. Seal me oleme realiseerinud ka tööpoo, siis nimeküksuste lahendamiseks ja, ja me oleme saavutanud päris hea täpsuse. See on 0,97%, 97% on täpsus. Saagis hetkel on, on küll suhteliselt madal, aga praktiliste rakenduste jaoks on ta, on ta tegelikult suht piisav. Küll aga me töötame selle nimel, et seda saagis tõsta siis. Ja, ja kui vaadata veidike selle nii mudeli sisse, mis on siis eelkõige nimega üksuste tuvastamise või lahendamise poole pealt, siis isikute juures see saagiseks on meil ligi 80% tulnud, firmade juures ta, ja organisatsioonide juures, need veidike laiemaks, on ta 30% juures umbes. Ja, ja põhjused on siis selles, et, et, et organisatsioonide nimede juures on rohkem variatsioone, kuidas neid mainitakse siis online kanaalites. Ehk siis... Kui me võtame mõne suurema ettevõtte, siis tal on sellised erinevad lühinimed, pikad nimed. Eli on näiteks, mis ametlik nimi oli tal kunagi Eli on ettevõtte taes. Tema, tema nimi, hüüdnimi või inimesed kasutasid Elioni. Osad, osad inimesed kasutavad, enamik inimesi kasutab nüüd Eliat. Selle nime asemel, et nimed muutuvad ka ajas. Võibolla organisatsiooni see keeb samaks, aga nimed muutuvad, see on teine probleem. Ja, ja siis võibolla kolmas probleem on see, et et see komplekt, mida me kasutasime, et seal, seal väga, väga hästi on kaetud tolle hetkel hindamise hetkel avalike, avaliku sektori asutuste osakaal. Ehk siis nende mainimiste leidmise, leidimine viis seda saagist niimoodi alla. Päike näide, ma ei, kuidas selle kohta, et kuidas, kuidas me neid mainimisi siis niimoodi koteerime, ma olen võtnud selle lähenemise, et kui me töötleme andmed niimoodi ära, me oleme käinud läbi selle kadalipu, et, et me oleme kogunud kokku Eesti, Eesti veebi niimoodi artefaktid erinevatest aegadest. Me oleme eraldanud tekstilise osa sealt. Me oleme tekstilisest osast er, selle ära limatiseerinud, leidnud üles nimega üksused, nimed üksused niimoodi ära lahendanud. Siis see lõpptulemus, seda, selle koteerimiseks me kasutame siis linkandmete prinsiipi, mis tähendab siis seda, et, et me koteerime need andmed kolmikutena ja, ja nende objektide äh, identifitseerimiseks. Me siis igale objektile paneme siis sellise unikaase identifikaatori, 
mis, mille tagant tegelikult, mis on esitatud siis urlina. Et see on võibolla see põhiprinsiip. Eks siis antud juhul see, mida me näeme, on, on meil üke, üks mainimine. Mainimises on mainitud Tartu Ülikooli. Viidatakse organisatsioonile, mille registrikood on, ma algab 74-aga, see on Tartu Ülikooli registrikood, eks siis on juba lahendatud. On me, eh, olemi tüüp on organisatsioon, olemid võivad olla ka isikud meie puhul. Ja, ja samuti on siin viide siis, et kus ta siis, kus ta siis sai niimoodi eraldatud. Eks siis antud juhul, ta on eraldatud 2015. aasta, 14. veebruari Tartu Ülikooli teaduskooli ühe lehe hetke seisus siis. Et see on siis viide sellele allikale, kus ta on võetud. Ja, ja see allike info on siin ka välja toodud, et täiendavalt me kodeerime ära siis millal see allikat me külastasime, Ja, ja mis on siis tema asukoht? Ja, ja miks me seda kõik niimoodi teeme ajas on see, et, et info võibis muutub ja, ja me ikkagi tahame tagada selle, et kui me oleme mingisuguse teadmise veebis kätte saanud, et meil oleks võimalik ka faktiliselt pärast minna selle, selle alg, algi juurde tagasi. Projekti raames on seni kaitsud Neli Pakkalauruse ja magistri tööd. Hetkel on ette valmistamisel üks magistri tööpeal peamiselt just nimeküksuste tuvastamise poole pealt. Ja, ja siis kooste kohta ka veel paar, paar märkust, et, et kui ma räägin koostööst registr OÜ-ga, siis, siis see sümbioos näeb siis välja selline, et me kasutame selle organisatsiooni andmeid ja firmade isikute kohta selleks, et oma, oma nimeküksuste lahendamise mudelit paremaks teha, heaks teha. Ja samal ajal siis see kasu ettevõttele on siis see, et, et tema seda loodud mudelid saab kasutada siis oma rakendustest, mis peamiselt on seotud meedia mainimiste tuvastamisega. Kitsamalt on siis seotud turuuringute läbiviimise kampaaniate mõõtmise konkurentsianalüüsi ja, ja taaviste muude rakendustega. Üks rakendustest, kuhu need mainimised võibolla selle aasta keskel võiks jõuda, on siis selline toode nagu Inforegister Now, mis toob välja siis firmade kohta sellist aktuaalselt informatsiooni. Kui sa oled konkreetsele firmale nii-öelda lepinguliselt seoses, siis sa oled uvitatud, et tema kohta tuleksid teavitused, kui tema midagi juhtub. Ja siis firma mainimine meedias on siis üks liik teavitusi. Et antud lehel siis me slaidil näeme siis teavitus selle kohta, et, et firma Eli on, on liitunud Emtiga ja, ja siis nüüd neid kutsutakse Eliaks. Et see on siis selline nii-öelda tähtis teadanne, mis on veebist üle, üles leitud, kasutada siis nimeküksuste tuvastamismehanismi, kõigepealt see järele lahendamismehanismi ja, ja siis võetud kasutusele rakenduses. Ja siin on mõned näited siis päringutes ka, mis, mis siis rakendusliides, kuhu need andmed on siis niimoodi, mis läbi, läbi rakendusliidese on siis on võimalik kätte saada nende andmete puhul. Ehk sisuliselt äh, äh, selle projekti raames saab, olema, saab siis kätte saadavaks äh, rakendusliides, kus saab siis küsida mainimisi, kas siis nimed alusel. Ja ta esimene meil on siin näide selle kohta, kuidas Toomas Enri Kilvese ta, mainimisi leitakse üles. Ja Barbie Wilbre mainimisi või Tartu Ülikooli mainimisi või, või siis nii-öelda muid mainimisi, kus vastavad nimed on sees. Näited, kuidas nad võib-olla ütlen veebiliidesse silmuvad on selliselt, samamoodi nad läbi rakendusliidesse saavad olema Jasonis või XML-is. Ja, ja samamoodi rakendusliidesse kaudu on kätte saadavad siis konkreetselt, see on juba nii lahendatud, lahendatud nimeküksused. Nende puhul siis saab küsida juba konkreetse registrikoodi isikukoodi alusel, et, et kus, kus on siis neid isikud mainitud, et antke need mainimis. Ja siin on näide siis... Tartu Ülikooli mainimiste kohta, nii-öelda mõned mainimised ja siis Toomas Enri Kilmese mainimiste kohta. Aitäh! Selle samade organisatsiooni nimede tuvastamise kohta tahtsin küsida, et kas on niimoodi, et 
että et siis jääb see dokument, kus see organisatsiooni nimi on kõrvale, mitte nii, et ei, ta vastatakse ainult üks tema nimetamine ja teisi ei avastata. Te mõtlete praegu nüüd seda mehanismi, et kuidas see... Kuidas, et, kui, et kuidas see ajal... nagu nimetuvastuse statistika on, et ta... Et, no, et ah, te mõtled selle, selle mudeli kohta, et, et nimed, nimede lahendamise juurus, et äkki seda võetas ilmas. Et, ei, kui jah, palju jah, me jah. suudame selle ära no, et Kui on palju erinevaid mm -hmm. varianti, siis tõenäoliselt, kui ühes dokumentis on mitu korda mainitud, mm -hmm. siis see dokument nii on ta läheb ikkagi arvesse ka siis, kui seal üks ainult ära tuntakse. Jah, ja. aga küll aga nende mainimiste juures me ikkagi eristame erinevaid mainimisi. Et hetkel mm -hmm. me küll ei salvesta seda metainfot, et kus konkreetselt selle tekstist me selle kätte saime. Seal, seal on omad põhjused, miks me seda ei tee. Aga, aga hüldiselt nii -öelda, need erinevad mainimised dokumentis, me ikkagi, et me iga mainimise kohta tuleb ikkagi eraldi kirja. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ja. Aga kas võib olla ka selline asi, ütleme, kui on näiteks tekst, milles on kõrkkoolidest juttu, mm -hmm. ühte mainitakse näiteks lühendiga ja teisi ei tunta ära nende mm -hmm. lühendi järgi, sest selle kohta veel andmeid ei ole, et mingit mehanismi, mis mm -hmm. nagu leiaks, et kui üks on juba mainitud, äkki siin midagi on veel. Ah, <laughs> Okei, okay, aga, aga no see viib rohkem sinna maa, nii et, 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 et seda taustaannete kvaliteedi juurde, et, et seda... Kui me tegime valiku, et millist tehnoloogiat kasutada nimega üksuste tuvastamise juures, siis, siis me valisime selle tee, et puhtalt nagu ütleme ärirakendustest nagu lähtuvalt, et, et pigem, pigem me tuvastame väga täpselt ära, aga, aga ei hakka koormama kasutajat või rakenduse loojad selle nii-öelda potentsiaalse müraga. Ja, ja sellest lähtuvalt tegelikult, kui meil, on, kui meil ei ole päris kindlad nii kas, kas see vaste nimede on või ei ole, siis pigem me seda ignoreerime. Ja, ja see tähendab nüüd ka see seda, et, et ma arvan, et, et see projekt, see keeletehnoloogia 57. projekt, mida me kasutame, mille teeke me kasutame, et nad suhteliselt hästi tunned, ma ära ka tegelikult need lühendatud nimed, aga, aga meil ei ole sellist tead mehanismi praegu, et neid lühendatud nimesid siis konkreetselt organisatsioonide identiteediga ära sidud. Aga, aga see on üks selle projekti nii-öelda tegevustes, millega me teeme, et, et luua siis selline al nagu sõnastik, et, et kuidas siis äh, juriidilist isikute ja nimesid niimoodi lühendatakse või pikendatakse. Aitäh. Tere! Tere. Uudis imu taristu suhtes. Ja. Vanes riigis, ma tean, Rootsis on see veebiregulaarne salvestamine, et peagud püha ülesanne ja rahvus raamatukogu mm -hmm. üleks andeks antud, ja. aga teie teete seda selle projekti raames. Ja, ja kuidas see tehnoloogiliselt? See on, ma arvan, et ta, ma, ei, ma ei ole päris kursis niimoodi, kuidas Rood siis, kas, mis tehnoloogiat seal kasutatakse, aga me kasutame sama tehnoloogiat, mida kasutab Eesti rahvusarhiiv. Ja, aga küll, miks me ei kasuta rahvusarhiivi materjali, on lihtsalt see tõttu, et, et, et nemad nii-öelda enda missioonist tulenevalt on, on teinud siis nii-öelda veidikene kitsama valiku nende veebi domeenid osas, mida nad, mida nad korjavad ja salvestavad ja sama puudutab ka tegelikult seda intervalli. Ehk puhtalt, puhtalt ne, ja, ja, aga me tahame seda skoopi niimoodi veidike laiemaks, mitte veidika, aga oluliselt laiema hoida. Aga muidu me kasutame sama tehnoloogiat, mida, mida näiteks Islandis kasutatakse, mida kasutatakse Eestis ja, ja Saksamaal üks ka isegi mõnes koos. Aitäh. Mm -hmm. Ma lihtsalt täpsustan, et sa mõtlesid vist rahvusraamatu kogu mitte rahvusarhiivi, eks? Veebiarhiiveerib või rahvusraamatu kogu. Ma pahen nad alati ühte oma mindsetis. Lõpuks lahetajale. Aitäh, Märkus. Ja mina küsin täpsustuseks, et nüüd kui on tegemist, kas te korjate informatsiooni .ee domeenist või? .ee omad pluss siis, ütleme, et mõned et me ärirekistrist, kui firma on mõne teise domeeni endal registreerinud, et siis need, need oleme ka võtnud. Okei, okay, ja kus te teada saate, et mille alusel te nagu teate, et see nüüd kuulub? See on, see on nüüd koostus register OÜ-ga, me oleme saanud siis need okay, ah, domeeni. Okei, register OÜ kaudu, ja. okei, okay, aitäh. Mm -hmm. Meil on vist, jah, Aeg, otsas, aitäh. 
Ahí está. Ja nyt tulepki ja lõuna.